Hello, this is John Evans, and welcome back to another episode of Book and Spade. Today's episode will be dedicated to the Battle of Hastings and the most famous year of English military history, 1066. Now, usually on this channel, we discuss theological matters, but perhaps there is no battle more significant for the Middle Ages than the Battle of Hastings. Yet why? If you are to think of three things whenever we mention the term medieval England, you'll probably picture a, a castle, a knight in shining armor, perhaps in a hauberk, and of course the term chivalry. But all three of these famous and perhaps stereotypical images are not English in origin at all, but Norman. And we should define our terms. Obviously, who then are the English? And who then are these Normans who fought at Hastings? Around the year 911, the Viking chieftain Rollo invaded France. At the siege of Paris, he achieved a great military victory. And Charles the Simple, gave him a land grant on the French coast in modern-day Normandy. There, these Northmen intermingled with the local Franks and established feudal systems of governance, systems which consisted of a lord and a band of warriors who owed him fealty. I'd like to compare this to another kingdom across the English Channel. England after the year 430, was invaded by the Angles, the Jutes, and the Saxons, German tribes that came over the sea to conquest and settle the land. By the year 1066, they were their own thriving culture, their own people. This is the culture that would eventually develop the poem Beowulf, a kingdom of thanes, of housecarls, of Germanic-styled mead halls. Now, the great moment of crisis came in terms of the succession of kings. When Edward the Confessor, the great high king of the Anglo-Saxons of England, died childless. Christmas Day, 1065, we know from all Norman and Anglo-Saxon sources that the health of this great king began to wane, and by January of 1066, he was no more. Now, Edward seems to have used his childlessness as a means by which he could court power. The Anglo-Saxons had many trading partners, many frenemies, as I would like to call them, people who were hostily friendly to them as they were trading partners. Among them were the Scandinavians in the north, who had long since invaded England many times on and off, and used York often as a trading base. And of course, as we have discussed, the Normans on the French coast across the English Channel. In the year 1051, according to a single entry into a lone surviving copy of the Anglo-Saxon chronicle labeled D, we hear a report that William, Duke of Normandy, somehow arrived in England. According to the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, he arrived with some soldiers, he met with the king, and left. The Anglo-Saxon chronicle in question, which is a matter-of-fact historical record, giving no thematic uh, structure apart from uh, just statements of what has occurred, gives no reason why William crossed the channel in that year. According to Norman sources, Edward had promised Duke William of Normandy his crown once he had died. Now, many historians are divided as to whether this event occurred. Regardless, as soon as Edward passed on in 1066, William felt he had a claim to the crown. 
According to Norman sources also, such as the Bayou Tapestry, a chief man in the court of Edward named Harold Godwinson, son of the richest man in Anglo-Saxon England, also supposedly swore oaths of fealty to Duke William of Normandy. Therefore, one cannot be surprised that Duke William was rather upset, to put it mildly, when he learned that Harold, the man who had sworn him fealty earlier, supposedly in 1064, had taken the crown for himself. The stage was set for a future conflict. Now, during Edward's lifetime, he had also apparently probably courted interests in Scandinavia. Um, and we know for a fact that Anglo-Saxon England had ties with kingdoms such as those found in Norway. Therefore, in the very year when Harold and William were planning military engagements, a figure named Harold Hardrada, king of Norway, was planning an invasion of England to try to take the crown for himself. As a result, 1066 would be a year of three battles and three kings, all vying for the throne of England. These 12 months would determine the future of English history and largely the history of the Western world. Now, the order of events that we are about to describe is preserved in many historical chronicles. Our earliest source is written by a man named William of Poitiers, he was a personal chaplain of William, Duke of Normandy, and therefore he was an eyewitness to many of these events, but he was writing from a Norman perspective. The same could be true, perhaps to the same extent, of William of Jumienge, another Norman author. Later authors such as Oteric Vitalis and William of Malmesbury record matters many years after the events, and therefore their records are sometimes suspect and sometimes open to question, along with the writings of a figure named Waith. Yet we also have a very special source for the battles we are about to discuss. This very famous source is called the Bayou Tapestry. It is basically a medieval comic strip. It was created by, presumably, Canterbury seamstresses over 10 years after the Battle of Hastings. And every scene of this tapestry depicts a passage in William's great conquest of the island of England. We will begin our description of these conflicts with Harold's battles with Harold Hardrada. This is because while William was preparing to invade England, while he was preparing to take the throne, Harold Godwinson, King of, Eng King of England, was himself preoccupied with his Norwegian invaders. Around September, let's say around September the 8th, Harold Godwinson was waiting for William to appear on his shores. William had not shown up yet. This is because he was waiting supposedly for favorable winds. Sources are divided as to whether he was waiting to see if Harold would strike first or what was occurring across the channel. However, we know that Harold Godwinson, King of England, disbanded his army in order for them to go home and tend to their crops. This is because the military system of England was not a standing army, but consisted of locals who were hired on from their shires to come and do service for their king. As a result, Harold had to quickly regather his forces when he learned that the Norwegians had invaded England from the north unexpectedly and had taken York or an area near York in an attempt to gain a foothold in the land. Harold Hardrada had made his first steps in England. As a result, Harold Godwinson, King of England, had to gather up his soldiers seemingly from scratch and march over 200 miles north 
to meet the Norwegians in open combat. At the Battle of Stanford Bridge, 1066, we know that Harold Godwinson was successful in destroying the Norwegian forces. He smashed the shield wall of the Vikings, and he also slew one of his chief rivals, his brother Tostik, who had gone over to the Norwegian force and had served as an ally. Three days later, Harold Godwinson was celebrating in York, a great victorious king. Yet he learned then that William, Duke of Normandy, had just landed six days earlier in Pevensey on the Sussex coast, and that with him were approximately, according to modern estimates, 5,000 to 7,000 men ready for battle. The invasion for England was on again. Now, let us discuss now some of William's preparations for invading England. If we are to understand William's plans, we must realize what his military force consisted of. Unlike the Anglo-Saxons, who were namely infantry, his army consisted of mounted warriors dressed in hauberks and conical helms, who we would call now knights. They were the elite of Europe's fighting force, and they were feared even on the continent. Yet William brought more than Normans with him to the shores of Sussex. He brought mercenaries from Flanders because his wife Matilda was the daughter of the chief ruler of that land. And with him were soldiers from Brittany, um, a province within the areas controlled by France. As a result, we had a strong force led by bowmen, knights, and infantry heading into the heartland of England. Also, William had achieved a great propaganda coup. He had achieved the assistance of the Pope. According to later sources and our earliest source, William of Poitiers, we have evidence that Pope Alexander II gave some form of approval to William's journey. In later sources, we know that he supposedly carried with him a papal banner. If William did carry a papal banner into the heartland of England, then it would have elevated his military adventure on the level of, let's say, almost a crusade. William felt he had God on his side. As a result, he boldly marched from Pevensey towards the village of Hastings, planning to meet Harold Godwinson in open combat. The battle that would ensue in Hastings would dramatically change the course of William's life in Western history. Now, all of our sources for the Battle of Hastings on October the 14th tell us that it was one of the longest battles in English military history and that it lasted approximately from 9 a.m. to dusk and maybe later. This tells us that the forces that met at Hastings were probably evenly matched. Estimates, as we have discussed on the Norman side, seem to range from, let's say, 5,000 to 7,000 men. The same figure could stand for the Anglo-Saxon army. However, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, in several different passages, such as C, D, and E, suggest that William's force was superior in numbers, and it suggests that Harold's army was weary from the long march. We do know Harold's forces were probably weary. Harold had to march 270 miles down from York to the village of Hastings, taking a stop in London for a short time to gather more, more soldiers. One question of many modern historians is, why didn't Harold wait? 
If he had waited in London to gather more soldiers for a couple more days or months, he could have re deployed reinforcements and have led a numerical advantage. But instead, he rushed to meet William, Duke of Normandy, in battle. Either way, we know that on the morning of October the 14th, Saturday morning, 1066, on top of a high ridge overlooking a plain, Harold's forces could be spied, a ring for battle. By 8.30 a.m., his forces had created a shield wall. They consisted primarily of infantry, and they had very few bowmen among them. At 8.30, William arranged his own army in three columns. Those men from Brittany on his left flank, those men who were of his Norman stock in the middle, and soldiers from Flanders on his right. Bowmen were before his company, in the middle were infantry, and his cavalry he kept in reserve. By 9 a.m., hostilities began with William. He ordered his archers to fire up into the Anglo-Saxon ranks. We know that it was a very bright morning, brighter than expected, and therefore it's possible that this could explain why the archers missed their mark. The arrows either flew over the heads of the Anglo-Saxons or, or were repelled by their shield wall. The infantry was deployed. By 9.30, William led a cavalry charge up against the Anglo-Saxon ranks. The mounted knights of Normandy thundered into the array. And yet, something terrible happened. At this time in the great struggle, William of Poitiers, William of Normandy's personal chaplain, records that William was unhorsed. By 945, the soldiers on the left wing of William's army, the soldiers from Brittany, heard that William was dead. This rumor was false. They probably saw William unhorsed and assumed the worst. It seemed as, as though the whole Norman army was in a rout. Panic ensued. Soldiers began to flee. At this point, many historians, such as John Gillingham, Stephen Morello, and even Robert Allen Brown, ask why, why didn't Harold Godwinson sweep the Normans off the field? His enemy was in disarray. The Anglo-Saxon king could have taken advantage of this chaos, but instead the Anglo-Saxons did not budge. Why? Option one, a counterattack was employed, but thwarted for reasons that we don't understand. Option two, this counterattack was thwarted because at this point in the battle, Harold Godwinson's two brothers, Leothwine and Geirth, Two housecarls, mighty leaders, were cut down. Their deaths were recorded in all the chronicles. This means that due to a loss of command, the Anglo-Saxons couldn't muster a counterattack. Or third, the soldiers were just too weary. The battle had gone on for far too long. Either way, by 10 o'clock, William realized he needed to re-rally his soldiers. So according to many of the sources, he took off his helm exposed his face to his soldiers, revealing that he was alive, and said something along the lines of, It is I, William, and I am still alive, and by God's grace we shall conquer yet. This rather Shakespearean moment was followed up by a new surge of energy among the Norman troops. They rallied behind their mighty leader, and by 1030 they surged back up the slopes. The Anglo-Saxons tried to fight off this attack, but it seems as though many soldiers had run down the hill, thus weakening the shield wall. Now commences a very weak and unnerving part of the battle in terms of the historical record. From 11 a.m. to approximately 6 p.m., we're not quite sure what necessarily occurred. According to Robert Allen Brown and others, 
feigned flight techniques could have been used by the Norman soldiers, where they charged the ranks of the enemy, but had to end up uh, returning back in order to draw the Anglo-Saxons away from their shield wall and down the hill. So by pretending to attack, they would draw soldiers farther away from their position. William of Poitiers says, up on the hill, the Anglo-Saxons stood like stones, immovable, while the soldiers of William moved this way and that. By 7 p.m., though, it was clear that Harold Godwinson's forces were not only weakened, but also in a desperate state. By 7.30, William, Duke of Normandy, deployed his archers. Around 7.30, the standard of Harold Godwinson fell. Sometime during this passage of events, the last great Anglo-Saxon king of England died. By 8 p.m., it was very clear. The Anglo-Saxon shield wall was broken. Soldiers fled their posts. And the battle was firmly won by William the Conqueror. Now, how are we to explain the death of Harold Godwinson? The Bayou Tapestry that we have previously discussed shows a certain passage where we see two men one with an arrow in his eye, tugging at the arrow, and the other being chopped to pieces on the ground. Above it is this Latin inscription, Herald Rex Infectus Est. Pardon me if the Latin is wrong. It means Herald the King lies dead or is killed. Now, it was traditionally believed that the man with the arrow in his eye was Herald, killed by that assault by the archers. But it's become fashionable in modern times to say it's the man being cut up to pieces to the right of him. This is because, according to one of our earliest sources, or later sources, there's great scholarly debate about this, the Song of Hastings, a hit squad of four knights, including maybe Eustace of Boulogne, marched towards the helpless Harold Godwinson and cut him to pieces, disfiguring the body. It's my personal opinion and I believe the opinion of Stephen Morello, if my memory serves me, that both men could easily be Harold Godwinson. The first depicting a wound to the face. Harold is blinded, or at least in great injury. He struggles through the field with his remaining house carls, but knights see him. Maybe among them Eustace of Boulogne, they come close and they savagely mutilate the body. Either way, we know that soldiers on the fields, according to William of Poitiers, could see the standard, the flag, of Harold Fall. And so, to this day, you can visit Battle Abbey, a monastery whose high altar is built, supposedly, on the site of Harold's death. And maybe he is buried there. That is the, tr the traditional site. Ultimately, why did William win the battle? According to Robert Allen Brown, who admits he is just as biased as William of Poitiers, it is because of his superior generalship. The new advent of the mounted knights riding into the scene with his stirrup, maybe the archers. According to Stephen Morello, it was the loss of the command of Geirth and Leithwine, a freak accident that led to the destruction of Harold Godwinson's forces. According to John Gillingham, we see two evenly matched forces which happened to fall in the favor of William because of a lucky draw. And because inevitably, we are dealing with two different styles of warfare. An Anglo-Saxon style of warfare on foot with shield and ax in hand, and one on the side of the Normans, representing future styles of combat similar to the mounted knight. Ultimately, I think all of these readings are partly correct. It is my opinion that the military force represented by William the Conqueror at Hastings was without question, in many respects ahead of its time, for bringing the knight to England. However, 
I think that Harold Godwinson's forces, while weary and having marched over 270 miles, nevertheless was a formidable force. Otherwise, the battle would not have lasted all day long. As a result, I think it was probably a combination of these factors and the loss of Gareth and Leothwine that led to Harold not making the counterattack at 9.45 a.m. when he needed to. Had he made that counterattack, Harold Godwinton would have been remembered for all ages as the greatest of all English kings, for having defeated Tostic and Harold Hardrada and William the Bastard. But William the Conqueror was successful that day, and we know he brought to England not only the mounted knight and, and armor, but also two castles. Castles which had not yet been seen on the English landscape. Norman law and forms of legislation. A new language to England that would dominate over the old Anglo-Saxon. And ecclesiastical reform. I believe it was Pope Gregory VII, the successor of Alexander II, who praised William for bringing reforms to the church in England, in Normandy, and across these realms. As a result, England, which had once been its own kind of, of kingdom, was now brought into the fold of Western Europe and into Latin Christendom in a new, perhaps maybe authoritarian way. In the last 13 years of William's life, he was not too militarily successful. But his legacy, through his successors, all the ways down to Henry II and others, proves that his conquest of England would forever shape our idea of chivalry, castles, and knighthood. I would ask you, though, to examine the evidence for yourself. Recently, I came across a BBC uh, miniseries called 1066, The Battle for Middle-Earth, in which the Anglo-Saxons were treated like warriors of, of the Hobbit or of the Rohirrim, and the Normans were openly called orcs. There is a tendency, I think, to overcompensate in some contemporary scholarship to wistfully see, mournfully, the loss of Anglo-Saxon culture and to see the Normans as new coming aristocrats imposing their culture. And this is because our earliest sources, such as the Bayeux Tapestry and William of Poitiers, William of Jumienge, are very pro-Norman sources. But I would ask you and many other historians to view this issue with open eyes, to see two rich and beautiful cultures coming together and eventually becoming fused over a series of generations, beginning in Hastings, that fateful morning on October the 14th, 1066. Thank you, and I hope to keep you posted with new episodes soon.